the nation so much. I guess we're just givers. We give you government. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> no, no need to thank the people here. We're just naturally givers. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm so very fortunate to be the bishop of the founding diocese, uh, even the diocese of Washington, the diocese of Maryland, and I have many friends in Washington and Maryland and throughout. Thank you for having me here, Warren. Thank you for uh, inviting me, even though you weren't quite sure I would be able to get here. I, I came, I was speaking at two other places today, and uh, and uh, we didn't know if I would get here in time, but I was here to hear your fine um, uh, update and, uh, on where we are in the Middle East. Hmm. Well, I know the Lord, I know the Lord, I know Lord laid his hand on me. You heard that? Yeah. I know the Lord. I know the Lord. I know the Lord laid his hand on me. Again. I know the Lord. I know the Lord. I know the Lord has laid his hand on me. Any basis here? Okay, I'm going to look for you. I know the Lord, I know the Lord, I know the Lord has laid his hand on me. <laughs> My wife's a choir director, she went, but you got the gist of it, I know the Lord. All right, if there are any altos here, I know the Lord, it's always the boring part of the altos. <laughs> I know the Lord, I know the Lord, I know the Lord has his hand Something like that. Okay? Faces, I know the Lord. 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 I know the Lord, I know the Lord, I know the Lord has laid his hand on me. Then you give the light before, I know the Lord has laid his hand on me. He does reach into the poor, I know the Lord has laid his hand on me. I know the Lord, I know the Lord, I know the Lord has laid his hands on me. I know the Lord, I know the Lord, I know the Lord has laid his hands on me. Your God, you have laid hands upon us <coughs> to do your reconciling work in the world. So now tell us what we need to do and show us how we are to be, to become your disciples in this world, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The scripture reading, or rather in the prayer that, was, uh, that we recited in our prayer for confession, we read, set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. As followers of the Prince of, Prince of Peace, we are called to be agents of reconciliation in the world. No less than St. Paul characterized the entire Christian ministry as being one of reconciliation. In 2 Corinthians 5, beginning at verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled the world to himself. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against, trespasses against them. 
and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Some of you would have been raised on the King James Version that would have had it, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. We have a textual issue here, textual problem. <laughs> if anyone is in Christ, to be more inclusive, what is Paul saying after that phrase? There is just the Greek phrase of creation. If anyone is in Christ, creation. What do you mean, Paul? If anyone is in Christ, are they new creatures, new creation? I think there's the Living Bible that has it. If any man is in Christ, he is a brand new creature inside. Do you mean persons? Individuals, I actually believe that Paul had a more cosmic significance to this phrase. If anyone is in Christ, creation, everything, old has, uh, the old has passed away, the old categories, the old ways of being, and then behold, the new has come. Now, you don't read behold in the new revised standard version, back in the New Testament, you will never see the word behold at all. There's that Greek word to do, right word? To do, behold. I mean, it, 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 that's a whole other sermon. Just know that the, the New Revised Standard Version, uh, in their attempts to make the language more accessible to everyone and, and ways that we can readily understand, the framers of that uh, translation know very well that you and I have probably not had a conversation in the last six months where we use the word behold. <laughs> <laughs> behold, honey, I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, my lord. <laughs> that probably doesn't happen much. It doesn't happen <laughs> it's a good word, behold. Mm -hmm. Uh, you look, you know, as they say, you look or see, sometimes see, all those great behold. And I think uh, see doesn't carry the weight, weight of behold. Behold is to take a long, lingering look. St. Paul is saying, if anyone's in Christ, the old has passed away. Behold. That's a word rarely used. It means something's going on here. You, you can't take a glance at this. This is not merely see, look at this. This is behold. Everything has become new. Paul, are you serious? To be in Christ, to be in the cosmic one who brings reconciliation into the world, if anyone is in there, everything has become new. All this is from God, he said, who reconciled us to himself and has entrusted to us the ministry of reconciliation. Well, that's the Bible. Why do I bring it up? Because if we're ever wondering what we are to do as followers of Jesus, Paul answers it. Be reconcilers. Be agents of reconciliation. Especially in a world that knows so much division that reconciliation seems hopeless. Do you remember Robert Frost's memorable line in that famous poem, North, uh, North of Boston, Mending Wall? Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. There is a wall in the Holy Land today that cuts through the city of Jerusalem. That city that Jesus left over and longing for. That is a wall of division Jesus still meets today. And you know, the so-called security wall, the isolation wall, the wall that the Israeli government built to ostensibly give to its people 
it's, it's well desi it, it's desired and well deserved security. But there is every indication that that wall won't do what it was what it was set out to do because walls never do. Something there is a uh, something there is about a, that doesn't love a wall. Something about a wall. God doesn't seem to agree with. It's always been the case. Do you remember the first great structure built in ancient history in the book of Genesis? The Tower of Babel. The story of the Tower of Babel I had always heard was one of human beings trying to attain in their prideful state to, uh, to God's level. I have a different reading of it. And that is the attempt of humanity ascending toward God and putting everyone in that wall and the wall of sameness, the wall of uniformity. God couldn't stand it. God confused, tore down the wall and confused their languages. That is the message, I believe, of the Tower of Babel. That in our attempts to make everyone the same, God instead disperses and says, value the diversity in language. The Tower of Babel had to come down. Human beings cannot, uh, were not meant to live behind such walls. Do you remember Jericho? The first time I was there, John Peterson, uh, the National Cathedral, was leading a pilgrimage there, some of you, probably have been on this pilgrimage where he has you spend over a half day at Tel Jericho. And he, of course, the biblical archaeologists are always trying to show you why the Bible wasn't true. <laughs> I love John. That's not quite the case. He, he talked about, he tried to imagine what were these ancient walls, the walls, but you know the story. The walls of Jericho built, of course, to keep the right people in and the wrong people out. The people of God come, and God commands Jericho to form a choir. And so that army of choristers goes around the city singing songs, undoubtedly singing songs of freedom and liberation. I was raised a Baptist, by the way. I know, I look Episcopalian. <laughs> <laughs> My home church, Mount Delta Baptist Church, is only blocks away from here. Mount Delta Baptist, I tell you the way I was raised, I we almost broke down the walls in that church when the gospel choir was singing. They surrounded that city and marched. And they, they shouted. And those walls came tumbling down. It had to. Walls always do. Do you remember Adrian's wall? Northern Europe, again, that uh, attempt to keep the right people in and to keep those hordes from the north from coming down into England, it didn't work. What about the Great Wall of China? Attempted to do the same, to provide a, a, some sort of security and in keeping invaders out well, you can visit that remains of that wall today and stand on it. It didn't work. Walls never do. Certainly in biblical times and in our time, there are many who believe that the wall that is being proposed right now along our southern borders and it's already been, uh, has already started to be built will have the same effect. It won't keep anybody because walls don't. Something there is about a wall that God doesn't like. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. And of course, those walls, the walls of Babel and Jericho and Hadrian's Wall and Great Wall of China, these are but physical manifestations of something else going on within human hearts. The walls of separation that are every bit as strong, every bit as every bit of barrier as the physical walls. 
when I was a young boy, my parents marched. They marched in this city and they marched in other places. Why? Because of the walls of segregation and Jim Crow laws needed to come down. And how did they come down? So much so that I eventually, their son, to be elected first African American bishop of Maryland, a state where the first bishop and most of his clergy, clergy owned slaves. How did they do it? Not by power or might in human terms. Not by the power of the gun or by bombs. But because people again assembled as that army of horses. And we sang with Martin Luther King Jr. and others, and we marched. And many said, what are you doing that for? For that won't change anything. But those walls came down. They had to. <coughs> and in South Africa, where I've also led a couple of pilgrimages and going to Robben Island, and there we recall Nelson Mandela being imprisoned there for 26 years. And in that campaign to end the walls of apartheid in that country, led frequently by church leaders such as Desmond Tutu and Alan Busak and many others, and even many in the ANC were actually choir members, I, I, I found out there, uh, like Walter Suzuki and, and others, were very much men and women of faith. Apartheid came down not so much because of the violence, but because the people wanted it to come down all over the world. Apartheid could not stand when people cried against it. And many of you recall in 1987 when our former President Reagan there at the Berlin Wall, at the Brandenburg Gate, and he looks over to the leader of the then Soviet Union and says, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And that wall eventually came down because they all do. They all do. Those walls are physical manifestations of other walls, walls of hostility, walls of separation, walls of degradation. It is no surprise that when Desmond Tutu went to the Holy Land a few years ago and said, I've seen this before. I know what's happening here. We've been there. And he, and he called for international, uh, international condemnation against the walls being, uh, being constructed in Israel, not just the physical wall but any wall of barrier. If anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, does the old pass away? The old barriers? The old dividing walls? The old ways that we think matter to us? The categories based on gender, based on language and skin color, in religion, in orientation, walls between old and young, black and white, you name it. It all comes down. Sometimes it takes the church a very long time. I reminded a group today, we were reflecting on the mystery of the Trinity and how we're still trying to figure that one out. I said it took the church 1,900 years to say without equivocation in all of its parts around the world that enslaving other human beings for profit is sin. It sometimes takes us a long time, but the movement is very, very clear. Tear down the walls. The last time I was in the Middle East, the last time I was in the Holy Land, it was about a year and a half ago, this time, I didn't take very many pictures. I was too depressed. Too depressed. 
I didn't want to take pictures of what I had seen. We had gone to Ramallah. We had gone to so many places where, pe where people were showing me their pastors and saying I cannot visit my other family members. It was too painful to be in, uh, to where us in the past I could go to uh, Bethlehem and there would be thousands of pilgrims in Bethlehem and I went that last time. There were dozens. We in the West could fairly easily get to the checkpoints, but not, not many others. It was depressing. But while I was in Bethlehem, I did take one photo. And this photo, this photograph hangs in my office in the diocesan center today. I was in, I was in that part of Bethlehem uh, just outside the wall. That wall had bifurcated the main commercial drag. And we were there encouraging everybody in our group to buy, buy anything in sight. You know that when you travel, of course. It is your duty. It is your duty to buy. <laughs> You're not trying to cut a deal. Not you from uh, the places where many of us live in, in the U.S. You were to buy. So we were buying the regular trinkets and all those kinds of things that we used to sell at the National Cathedral. <laughs> God bless the money changers in the temple. <laughs> right, John? <laughs> Well, I went outside and saw a piece of the wall there. And of course, all sorts of things were spray painted on it. Something caught my eye in the corner of it. And this is what it says. Somebody spray painted, Jesus will tear down this wall. That picture came to my office. The words of the prophets are still written on the subway walls and tenement halls and security walls. Jesus is going to tear down that wall. Jesus always can. Jesus always will. Whatever walls you built up in your heart against another human being, for whatever reason, Jesus is going to tear it down. Because when you are in Christ, walls go. And that's why Paul said in Ephesians 2, for Christ is our peace. Christ is our peace. And he has abolished the, the, the wall, the dividing wall between us. That is the wall of hostility. Jesus is going to tear down that wall. Jesus is going to tear down every wall and instead build bridges. That's why we're here. If you think that what you do this week doesn't have cosmic significance, how can you call yourself a person of faith? You write a letter. You make a phone call. You say a word. You're an agent of reconciliation. And many will tell you that, what, that these efforts won't amount to much. Look what you're up against. Powerful groups that do not want what you want, that have a stake in keeping the vision there on either side. And they will tell you to stop or to go to something else. You will never, ever achieve peace in the Middle East. Well, they tried to tell my parents and others that those little things they did didn't matter because racism and segregation and Jim Crow are there forever. They tried to tell Nelson Mandela that. They tried to tell Alan Booth that. They, have, they tried to tell everyone who tears down a wall, a wall, give up! But the wall comes down and bridges come instead. I would end by just recalling for you a poem by Georgia Douglas Johnson. She was a Harlem Renaissance poet. And for a good piece of her life, she lived, again, not far from here, in Shaw, 
the Shaw area of D.C. But uh, she's more known for being in Harlem and during the Harlem Renaissance. But her poem, Interracial, can speak to us today. Let's build bridges here and there. Or sometimes just a spiral stair that we may come somewhat abreast and sense what cannot be expressed. And by these measures can be found a meeting place, common ground, nearer the reaches of the heart, where truth revealed stands clear apart. With understanding come to know what laughing lips will never show, how tears and torturing distress may masquerade as happiness. Then you will know when my heart's aching, and I, when yours is slowly breaking, commune, the altars will reveal. We then shall be impulsed to kneel and send the prayer upon its way for those who wear the thorns today. Oh, let's build bridges everywhere and span the gulf of challenge there. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.